So ladies and gentlemen, we have our fourth panel. <laughs> it's a rich day. And uh, so we're going to continue with the exploration of specific cases. And uh, so we, as that was, it was alighted this morning and uh, we continued this afternoon, as you can notice, the situation is very different from one basin to another one. And the agreements are quite different one from each other uh, with respect to substantive law, to procedural norms, as well as with respect to dispute settlement mechanisms. So we're going to have uh, three cases, and I'm very happy and honored to be chairing this panel. We'd like first to introduce Dr. Salman Salman, who is uh, now affiliated with the International Water Resources Association, not to, to reveal uh, all of my life, my former life, but when I went to the World Bank in 95, Salman Salman was already there, and I learned a lot uh, through Salman, with Salman. He taught me a lot about international water law and the international law, and we even developed on, this man. practice uh, in, uh, <laughs> when we were at the bank. And then, since then, we've continued and we've worked on different uh, cases and, uh, and, and situations. So he is currently with the, uh, this association, and he's also the editor-in-chief of the International Water Law Journal, and you have, we'll show you one of the examples. It's not that we want to attract authors, but if you want to publish <laughs> something about water, it's a very good journal, okay? <laughs> so that would be the first presentation, and we will be speaking about another region of the world, the Nile region. Then we will have uh, Dr. Ashok, uh, I'm going to destroy the Swain, that, yeah with uh, a professor of peace and conflict research and the director of research school of international water cooperation at Uppsala University. He did his PhD uh, in, uh, at New Delhi at the Nehru University. And he's been involved in a lot of uh, water issues, uh, discussing uh, issues related to security, environment, conflict, and so on. And we have also a great benefit, Victor, because Professor Swain is a non-lawyer. <laughs> and so it's also important to have other disciplines giving us some insights about the role of law in the management of international water courses. And with uh, Ashok Swain, we will be discussing the situation, the Indus River situation. And then we will have Professor Alistair Rio Clark, who is uh, a professor at Northumbria University in England, at Newcastle. But he's also currently in Geneva, working as a legal officer with the Secretariat of the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. So it's one of the two universal conventions and uh, discussing and trying to look at the SDGs and uh, the fulfillment of the SDG, the Sustainable Development Goal on water. And uh, Alistair has been working in different capacities, advising states, advising international organizations. And he is, will be speaking about another specific situation, which is the Mekong River situation. So we will have three case studies. So the, Dr. Salman Salman, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I think I should really start with thanking the Max Planck Institute for putting together such a wonderful group and such a splendid conference, and for extending the honor and pleasure for me to be part of it. Uh, thanks, Helen. Uh, I'll be talking about the Nile, and uh, a number of characteristics uh, really distinguish the Nile from other shared water courses. Uh, world's longest river, 6,660 kilometers largest lake in the developing world, and second largest lake in the world, uh, Lake Victoria, first is Lake Superior, oldest and large dams. And then the, the, the largest swamps, the Sud swamps in South Sudan, the largest swamps, which could, could extend to 30,000 kilometers during the rainy season. Oldest and most controversial treaties. And this is really the crux of the Nile, the, the treaties. Oldest, they started in 1891, and the most controversial, because there isn't a single treaty amongst the close to 20 treaties that is accepted by all the riparians. Each treaty is disputed by some or the, uh, the others of the riparians, and that is the crux of the problems in the Nile. When we go to the, talk about the cooperative framework agreement, we'll find the basis for the 
different season disputes, the, what they call colonial treaties. When we come to the uh, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, we'll find also the crux of the dispute is really the colonial treaties. So it is really the umbrella under which all the other uh, disputes and all the other problems start creeping. Uh, cradle of ancient civilizations, uh, the Egyptian civilization, the Kush civilization, Northern Sudan, Aksum, Aksum civilization in Ethiopia, the Buganda in the Congo. Ethnic, religious, and linguistic diversity. We have the four major uh, religions and the four major languages, the Hinduism, uh, sorry, uh, Islam, Christianity, uh, Judaism, and uh, there we have the English, Arabic, French, there also. 11 countries, region of extremes, poverty, 9 of 15, in the poorest in the world, and there is high variability and climate change, and there are conflicts, conflicts since 1994, 10 of the 11 countries have been involved in conflicts. And the other characteristic is small flow system. 84 billion cubic meters, as mentioned in the 1959 treaty, that makes it only 2% of the Amazon River, 6% of the Congo River, 12% of the Yangtze, 17% of the Niger, yet the Nile is the, the one that's... Uh, because of that, partly the Nile is really uh, uh, having a lot of disputes. Very limited infrastructure, 10% of the hydroelectric power potential developed, 15% of population with electricity, 10% uh, irrigable land irrigated, uh, excluding Egypt and Sudan. Uh, there are also other characteristics, uh, other characteristics of variability. Ethiopia contributes 86% uh, of the water of the Nile. It reaches 95% during the flood season. Egypt, uh, minimum rainfall, consumes 85%. High evaporation losses in the sud, uh, swamps of southern Sudan. And then there is variation between the White Nile and the Blue Nile. We tend to think of them as two equal uh, tributaries. They are not. Uh, the, the White Nile uh, uh, contributes only 14%. 86% of the water comes from the... Uh, from, uh, sorry, the White Nile contributes uh, only for, uh, 14%, but we have the Sobat River, which comes from Ethiopia. So the Ethiopian plateau is the source for 86%, whereas the Equatorial lakes are the source of 14%. Uh, challenges, large number of challenges. I, say, I mentioned the limited flow, increasing demands, population, 250 million living in the, in the basin expected to reach uh, 500 million by 2050. Major differences over uh, Nile Cooperative Framework Agreement. This is what is called the Entebbe Agreement, which we'll come to in a minute. And then there is uh, now the Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam. And this is basically the characteristics of uh, what I call unilateral development plans. Uh, this is just a, a quick uh, uh, chart, of, uh, chart which will look quickly about the major tributaries and contribution. The Blue Nile, uh, 59%. The White Nile, 14%, Sobat, 11 Adbara, 11 Adbara, so Adbara, Sobat, and the Blue Nile are the ones that come from the Ethiopian plateaus, and the White Nile is the one that comes from the Equatorial Lake. And there are the variabilities. The Blue Nile is uh, full of sediments, brings a lot of... Uh, uh, because of soil erosion in Ethiopia and the high, uh, the high speed of the flow, while the White Nile is steady. Uh, the Blue Nile comes in three months. Most of the water comes in three months. About 70% of the water comes between June and September. 30% comes in the nine months. So another difference, while the White Nile is steady throughout the year. And we could see this is the confluence of the Blue Nile and the White Nile in Khartoum. The, this is the White Nile, which we could see the water is, is quite uh, clean, and this is muddy and full of erosion. Uh, basin area, three million square kilometers. And you will also see the uh, variation. 63% was in Sudan before South Sudan break, broke away. Now it's about 45 in uh, Sudan and about 18 in South Sudan. And then you have Ethiopia, the second with 11, close to 12. Egypt with 9. And then Uganda with 7. But then if you look at Uganda, it has 7% of the Nile Basin, but 99% of the country falls in the Nile Basin. Similarly, the Rwanda. You have less than 1% in the Basin area, but about 80% of the country falls in the Nile Basin, so really major variations. The 11 countries, we divide them into uh, four categories, Egypt, Ethiopia, Sudan, and South Sudan, where the stakes are very high. Uh, Uganda, high, while Burundi, Kenya, Rwanda, and Tanzania are medium. Uh, Democratic Republic of Congo and Eritrea are very low because of the, the... In Eritrea, there is only one small tributary, and in Congo, they have the Congo River, which is 17 times the Nile. Those are the treaties that were uh, concluded in the, on the Nile from 1891, a number of them, but I, there is no time to go through all of them, but quickly we'll go through the three of them. Uh, the 1902 treaty between Ethiopia and, in, and Great Britain, 
Uh, it was a border treaty, but it gave Britain, uh, gave Britain veto power over projects in the Eastern Nile, uh, and uh, Ethiopia wouldn't, under that treaty, carry out any project without the approval of Great Britain. Egypt claims to have succeeded to the treaty. Ethiopia rejects that and says the treaty wasn't even ratified by any of the organs. So this is a major dispute, and actually the Renaissance Dam dispute is based on this. Ethiopia is claiming that, uh, Egypt is claiming the 19, uh, validity of the 19 Treaty, and Ethiopia is saying it's not valid. Another treaty, 1929 agreement between Great Britain and, and Egypt, Great Britain representing four African countries, uh, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, and Sudan, it gave uh, Egypt the veto power over projects on the Nile. Again, the treaty is rejected by the U Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, under the Nairi Doctrine, which gave it two years. So those are two treaties which are basically the crux of the dispute on the Nile. And then this is, was added, this was, to this was added the 1959 treaty. This is a bilateral treaty between Sudan and Egypt, which really, did, what it did was it divided the entire flow of the Nile between the two countries. Flow of the Nile is the size of 84 billion, 10 billion goes on evaporation, 74 billion was divided between Egypt and Sudan, and the treaty says, if any country claims some of the waters of the Nile, they should come to the two of us, we'll decide whether to give them any, and uh, if we decide to give them any, we will supervise that they don't exceed it. So, complicate, 1902 treaty and 1929 treaty got more complicated by the 1959 agreement. The in the 90s, things start changing a little bit, and there are two agreements which really not much is, no is known about them. Uh, one was signed between Ethiopia and uh, Sudan, 1991, called Khartoum Declaration, and it refers to the Nile, it refers to the uh, equality of the riparians, it, it refers to equitable and reasonable utilization, which you read it and you think this is what should be there, this is what the UN Convention is about, this is what international water law is about. But then again, a few weeks later, the 1929 and the 1902 agreements surface and try to uh, undo what is done by the 1991 agreement. A similar agreement was signed in Ethiopia and Egypt with the same provisions on equitable and reasonable utilization, on equality of riparians, on cooperation. But again, when things get start getting, uh, when the uh, disputes get teed up, uh, Egypt would bring the 1902 and the 19. 29 and the, and the 1959 agreement. This, the, the, the 1991, uh, those two agreements led to the uh, beginning of co kind of cooperation and the Nile Basin Initiative, which was started in 1999. And it, it, it had a, a very interesting uh, motto. Uh, it says that the, uh, this is a vision to achieve sustainable socioeconomic development through equitable utilization of and benefit from the common Nile Basin water resources. Everyone who reads it thinks that this should have done away with the veto power and with the hegemony of Sudan and Egypt. And the, 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 process, the Liberian countries started to negotiate the framework agreement that is inclusive of all of them. And after 10 years, this is the, just for a second, this is the Nile Basin Secretariat, the Nile Basin Structure, the NTB Secretariat. And then we have the Eastern Nile in Addis Ababa, Eastern Nile office in Addis Ababa. And then we have the Southern Nile in Kigali. Now this, so you have nine kind of, nine kind of council ministers, technical advisory committee, and the secretariat, and those three offices. It's a very, very ambitious and very uh, started very as a very ambitious project. But then difficulties start running when the uh, work starts in the cooperative framework agreement. Ten years of negotiations, and the parties ended in square one. Uh, basically, the agreement was complete agreement with all the provisions that we know about, and then suddenly. Sudan and Egypt wants a reference to their existing uses and rights, basically the 1902 and 1929 treaty, which was rejected by the others. There are no notification provisions. Egypt and Sudan demanded notification provisions. So, so those are the two major issues, and they are major issues. Uh, reference to the colonial treaties and the uh, la lack of, uh, re lack of uh, inclusion of provisions on notification. So the process collapsed, and uh, six countries signed the treaty, uh, Ethiopia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, Rwanda, and Burundi. Three of them ratified it. It needs six uh, instruments of ratification to enter into force. So far, we have three. Sudan and, uh, and Egypt vehemently oppose it. So a major dispute, a major problem sitting there. And then suddenly, as this is the signing of the, uh, three, uh, the CFA, the Cooperative Framework Agreement. It's called, also called Entity Agreement in, 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 uh, in Entity in May 2010. And as if the problems were not, uh, the C CFA were not enough, suddenly we had the major issue of the Grand Ethiopian Resistance Dam, 
which is UB start building in March 2011, in, in, announced in March 11, and start building in April 20. It lies, uh, lies about 20 kilometers from the Sudanese borders. Let's have a look at the location. This is the location of the Grand Ethiopian Residence Dam. 20 kilometers from Sudan. It's 170 meters high. Lake capacity is 74 billion cubic meters of water, and that's where the concern of Egypt and Sudan. The largest dam in Africa and 10th largest in the world, expected to, to generate 6,450 megawatts of electricity, one of the largest uh, amount of electricity. Uh, it, uh, the, the, dam start, the buildings of the dam started in 2011, and uh, construction by the Salini Company of Italy, Chinese building the emission lines, Europeans providing mechanical equipment, but the most important part is the funding. It's coming from Ethiopian own resources. They, they have not resorted to any uh, borrowing because they know it will be difficult to borrow, so they relied on their own. And so far, they have been able to meet the, the cost which is expected to, ri to, to uh, reach $5 billion. Uh, Egypt opposed vehemently the GERD, said that the decrease of water flow, uh, decrease of irrigated agriculture, decrease in electricity at the dam. Sudan wavered at the beginning, but finally decided to support the dam because of the downstream benefits of flood control and sediment control and uh, regulation of the flow. Uh, the, this is a famous uh, meeting of the opposition and the government, the government and the opposition of the Egyptian government and the opposition where the use of force was discussed. And the unknown to the people in the meeting, the meeting was broadcast live. So the, whatever was said came out and there was talk about bombing the dam and arming some groups. Uh, what the, one, one interesting development that took place was Ethiopia refused to provide any information at the beginning to Egypt and Sudan. Uh, to Egypt, and Sudan. Egypt and Sudan demanded full notification under the provision of the UN Convention on International Law. Finally, the issue was settled by establishment of international panel of experts consisting of 10 people, 10 from each of the three countries and four from outside. So it, it really resolved the issue of notification because of the information provided, Egypt was, has a seat in the table, Sudan had a seat in the table, and Ethiopia had a seat in the table. So it was a very nice way, it turned out to be, uh, <laughs> thank you very much, <laughs> of, of, of resolving the issue of notification. Uh, the panel issued its report in, uh, in May 31st, and it pointed that the, uh, there, are, there, are, uh, there are certain studies that need to be done in more depth, and recommended two in-depth studies. This is the report of the International Panel of Experts on the Grand Sea Venice Dam. Recommended two in-depth panel, uh, two depth, two studies to be done in depth, and the studies are still going on, carried by two French firms, uh, BR BRLI and uh, I think BRLI. Is, uh, the situation continued with the opposition of Ethiopia and Sudan, uh, uh, Egypt and Sudan, and Ethiopia going ahead, but suddenly there was an agreement that was signed on March 23rd. It's called the Agreement on Declaration of Principles on the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Very interesting agreement because it basically recognizes Ethiopia's right to use the waters of the Nile for development. For the, for development. And they agree that there is need for cooperation, obligation not to cause harm, principles of critical and useful utilization, exchange of data and information, and then cooperation on the basis, on the, uh, basis of sovereignty and territorial dignity, and peaceful settlement of dispute. You read it and you think you are reading the UN Water Courses Convention or the UNEC Convention. And that was, I think, a major breakthrough in the, in the, in the development. Uh, this was followed again by another agreement signed on March 23rd, uh, confirming the uh, earlier agreement and provide, talking about, uh, this, sorry, this is the same agreement. Uh, this was followed by, this is the signing of the agreement. It was signed by the three heads of states, uh, President Sisi, President Bashir of Sudan, and Prime Minister uh, Haile Mariam Selen of Ethiopia. This was followed by another agreement signed on March, uh, on December uh, 28, 2015, basically confirming the uh, earlier agreement because there were some rumors about Ethiopia, uh, about Egypt pulling out of the agreement, about things falling apart, about that the Egypt may use other means. But that, that agreement confirmed Egypt and Sudan position on the, on the Nile. And how much time do you have? Five, okay, five minutes. Okay. Uh, so the, this... Uh, I think there are more concerns. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I can use that. I'm, I'm finished. Uh, I, only have, I only have five minutes. Is this part of my five minutes? <laughs> yeah. No, no, I think, I'm, I think I will. I'll be okay. I, I, won't, I won't sue Max Planck Institute. <laughs> so 
I was talking about the, uh, the uh, December 2015, which is basically confirmed the, and confirmed the studies. It's PRI and Artelia to carry out the studies and then technical teams from the DG countries. Despite all those agreements, there are a lot of reports about the Egypt uh, complaining about the dam and complaining the dam is going to... But there are really two tracks going on. Agreements and technical committees and meetings going on on the one hand, and then a lot of reports about Egypt complaining about the dam and the dam will affect it and will harm its interests, will, will turn large tracts of land into desert. And Ethiopia, on the other hand, saying that no, nothing will happen, we'll, we'll, no, no harm will happen, we'll, we'll take care of it. But there, there is, under the, beneath, the, beneath the surface, there is, there is a lot of talking, a lot of discussion, and what we say, really, really some forms of cooperation going on. The dam is expected to be completed by the end of this year, beginning of this year, so it's a fair to complete now. And I think Egypt and Sudan have realized and recognized that this is a reality they have to deal with. And, uh, but the issue of the CFA and the issue of the dam itself for the, for the people will be, is it still a major issue of dispute, the two of them, the, sea, the cooperative framework agreement and the dam, and the issues are there. But, and I think the problem that the Nile Basin countries failed to look at is rather than look at the 84 billion cubic meters of the waters of the Nile and dividing it between them, look at the larger, broader benefits of the Nile. Huge hydropower potential in Ethiopia. 30,000 megawatts of electricity that can be generated from the dams in, from the water in Ethiopia alone. Large irrigable land in Sudan, about 20 million hectares of land that can be irrigated. With the wealth of Lake Victoria, uh, the fish, fishery wealth, it has more than 500 species of, 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 of fisheries in the lake. Egypt's industrial capabilities, the livestock of South Sudan, huge amount of livestock which is not commercialized for social reasons. So there are lots of benefits that the countries can look at, can look at and start to develop rather than look at the water. And that, that has been absent throughout the discussions and throughout the negotiations. On the issue of the CS, uh, this, this is, uh, someone sent me this last week from the airport of Ethiopia. Grand Ethiopian National Dam has brought a new era of cooperation in the Eastern Nile Basin. This is a poster there. Succeeding in getting nicknames by scholars like New Legal Order, a Game Changer, and a Fair System. As this is a, a poster everywhere in the... In the, uh, in the, in the uh, yeah, this our... So what I uh, conclude is the... Uh, the uh, Grand Sudan system has really resulted in leveling the Nile playing field. Egypt and Sudan accepted the equality of all Nile states, the basic principle of international water law, and accepted equitable or reasonable utilization as the cardinal principle of international water law. And Ethiopia has accepted the concept of notification. They had all the time uh, resisted notification, saying that if we notify Sudan and Ethiopia, uh, Sudan and Egypt, then we will get a reply saying 1902 treaty. Uh, so the, they accepted the no concept of notification. I have been suggesting for the last couple of months that the uh, NTB agreement of the, CFA, uh, the uh, cooperative framework agreement can be, the Gordian knot can be disentangled by deleting the reference to water security and the reference to the colonial treaties, 1902 and 1929, from the CFA, and by including provisions on notification. I think I thought this would be a compromise. I've written it and sent it to, and there is, there is some interest on, on, on this uh, compromise, and I hope it works out. Thank you very much. Perfect in time. <laughs> time. So, Ashok, it's for you. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, organizers, for inviting me. Uh, I know um, uh, after Itai, I'm the other one odd man out here. No knowledge in international law. Uh, but as I, I always look at the conflict, and though uh, I am supposed to look at cooperations. But anyway, I will try to focus on the Indus Basin. But before going to Indus Basin, um, I would like to uh, take you to the South Asia. South Asia, uh, the water, particularly transboundary water issue, is getting interesting uh, for a lawyer and for a researcher. Uh, not maybe for the people, but because of the, why I think, say it's getting interesting, 
because there are, used to be a traditional way of water sharing. There was a one, what some of our colleagues in England call it hydrohegemon that was in India, and there are other countries which are in South Asia which are using the water, uh, giving that emphasis to the Indian need. But things are changing. Uh, things are changing. Uh, South Asia, of course, changing um, because of its uh, population growth, as you know, economic development of some uh, different nature. But climate change uh, is uh, another factor. But the, another, the factor which is really making the change, which I think, is China. The China who, is, who controls the water resources in the Himalayan um, upstream. Not, was not a player in the South Asian water scenario till five, ten years back. But China by, has emerged very forcefully and successfully changing the dynamics of water power, water, water sharing in South Asia. I will come back to that. It has a good thing, it has a bad thing, like anything. So it's nothing that, you know, if you want to see in one way or other. There are Different disputes in South Asia, the Ganges River dispute, which has been going on for some time between India, Bangladesh, and also Nepal. Uh, it is, it's not only I'm only a social scientist. I used to actually, in front of uh, Salman, it's a very difficult thing to speak about these water issues in the South Asia. There was a time he was in the World Bank, uh, there was a long time in the World Bank. He was not allowed to speak on Nile, so he was speaking on the South Asian water, and I was speaking on the Nile. And now, you know, he, he, he gets his freedom back. I'm back to my old place. Um, so the, the Ganges uh, one, that's, that's something which is going on. Uh, that's a conflict. That the, the India Bangladesh have signed an agreement in 96, and that's going to be 30 years. So it's another nine years where the agreement will come into. There is another river, Tista River, which India, Bangladesh again are in dispute how to deal with it. But then the Brahmaputra, which connects with the Ganges in the middle of Bangladesh, that's where the China plays a big role. China has already built five dams uh, where China can control quite a lot of discussion, negotiations between India and Bangladesh. The reason is, India is not any more powerful upstream. So China is now the powerful upstream. Then let me move back, move to Indus. Indus River, um, that rises, I mean Indus is a six river system, but the main Indus River comes from the Tibet. You call it Tibet or China, whatever the way you want to say, that's fine. Uh, but th that runs through it, and there's another five tributaries, uh, Rabi, Bias, Jalam and Chenap, so, uh, Sutledge. So there are six river systems. Um, some of the rivers, like particularly Jalam, Rabi, and Sutledge, they are also, not only are the rivers coming from the China, sorry, India to Pakistan, but also are part of a boundary, long boundary system. But these, out of this, there are three Indus, Chelam, and Chenab. They come through Pak not Indian territory of Kashmir. Uh, again, you want to say the way you want to say it's an Indian administered Kashmir or Pakistan administered Kashmir, Indian occupied Kashmir or Pakistan occupied Kashmir. That's up to you. But it is coming through the Indian controlled Kashmir going to the Pakistan side. So that makes it much more interesting for a researcher, okay? Uh, what happened immediately after the partition, 1947, independence and partition? So the colonial administration had put most of the agricultural activities and the dams and the irrigation establishment in the Pakistan side. Some of you might have been aware of this discussion going on in Third World Quarterly article, the colonialism. I mean, you know, they keep arguing in the case favor of, I'm not arguing that, but at least colonial administration had invested quite a bit in the Pakistani Punjab on the irrigation purposes. But when the partition took place and Kashmir, or the major part of two-thirds of Kashmir stayed, or India kept it with it, 
Then the problem started because the upstream of the river stayed in the Indian side where the irrigation systems and the irrigated areas went to Pakistan side. The problem started from the very beginning. India was actually extremely anxious of how to achieve food security, massive migration, huge food insecurity. So you can imagine 26% of the budget immediately after the independence went to create the irrigation facilities all over. So India has built all kinds of big dams wherever you can find. They have not even run out of it because just last week they built another big one in the Narmada, which some of us were trying to stop it, but didn't. Um, <clears throat> so this is, this is going on there. So once India started to control the, kept the upstream and wanted to keep the water, of course Pakistan will be in a terrible situation because the Pakistan's irrigation facilities were dependent on upstream water. So the problem started from the beginning. The conflict started from the very first year of the partition in the 1947. In 1951, David Lilenthal, who was to be the uh, chief of uh, Tennessee Valley Authority, uh, he, that time he had retired, he had come around, he, wrote, he, went an, he went back to US and wrote an article in the Colliers saying that how World Bank could support India and Pakistan to develop these water resources. That was partly good idea, maybe more noble idea. The other one was that the United States wanted to keep India, Pakistan not falling into Soviet hand. So there was a kind of you know, mixed interest in bringing that kind of issues. But then, I won't continue this, but there was a long discussion kept on going between India and Pakistan. World Bank played the mediating role, and World Bank's probably only successful stories is the Indus, that's what World Bank thinks, is the Indus Treaty. Um, in 1960, they signed an agreement. It's the only agreement where World Bank is also a party. And that makes it exciting because this is India, Pakistan. You bring these two countries together, and then World Bank is another party. Um, what happened? Three rivers, there are six rivers. We make a lot of issue out of it. World Bank put, puts it as a huge success story. But you need to see this agreement is not a water agreement. Why I say it's not a water agreement? I call it a partition agreement. Because there are six rivers. Three rivers were given to India, and three rivers given to Pakistan. What kind of water agreement is this? It is just an extension of 1947 partition agreement which had divided the land, but had not divided the water resources. It's just that giving the three rivers to Pakistan side and three rivers to Indian side. What happened? In the three rivers which went to Pakistan side, Pakistan got 135, am I running out of time now? The way you look at me, I'm getting scared. <laughs> <laughs> the 135 million acre feet of water was given to Pakistan, and only 35, only, th only, only, only 33 million acre feet of water was given to India. But it has its reason. The reason is because the three main rivers, the three, three Indus, Jhelum, and Chenab, which were going to Pakistan side, these are the three rivers which are going through Kashmir side. And the three rivers, Rabi, Vyas, and Satlej, which were given to Indian side, they were in the mainland Indian side. So though the India complains that why that agreement is not fair to them, because only 33 million acre feet has water has given to India, but whereas 135 went to Pakistan. So that's the case is if the, any agreement cannot just bring that water to Indian side. We need to realize that, because this, if, if you need to bring that 135 million acre feet of water to Indian side, you need to use nuclear bombs to break some of the mountains in the Himalayas, and which I don't, you know, they don't need to go to Kim for that, but at least they don't want to use that at this time. Um, so it is, it's, it's a situation, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually the geography which forced them to get into that kind of agreement. What happened? The India had to pay 62 million 60,000 pounds 
and uh, because of the because of the, um, uh, the some of the water facilities which uh, you know which India used, but whereas pa Pakistan had to support Pakistan had to build the new water facilities, so that's why the Pakistan got the payment. World Bank also international agencies contributed internal industry development fund, but remember that India paid that money in spite of the time when India was fighting a war with Pakistan. Uh, because India has fought a war in, after 1960-1965 war, 1971 war, 1999 SMI war, and always there is a war. So it has been, at the time of even the three big conflicts was going on, India was, particularly 1965, India was paying that time that money. A permanent Indus Commission was established, um, two commissioners, one of them stay in India, the other in the Pakistan. Um, commission was interested to maintain a cooperative arrangement for the implementation of the treaty. Uh, it takes periodical inspection of the river and meet at least once a year. To keep the treaty going, you need to meet at least once a year. I remember there was a 2002, there was when, the, there, you might have heard there was a terror attack on Indian parliament in 2001. So 500,000 Indian army was encircling Pakistan border. That is the time when there was no flight was moved going from the India to Pakistan, nor from Pakistan to India. So the, the, the what do you call that, airspace was closed. That is the time, but it has to, once a year it has to meet, the, either, either in De first, other in Delhi or in Islamabad. That time the meeting was supposed to take place in Delhi. How the Pakistan commission will come to Delhi, that became a major issue. And we were all thinking whether the agreement will last or not. You know, they found Indians and Pakistan is fine, nice way to it. So the guy went to Dubai and flew from Dubai to Delhi, so the, your agreement stayed. The question comes, why, why this agreement? Because if you look at it, because that's what we need to realize. There hasn't been anything coming out of that agreement of, you know, because Indian, anything coming out, I, I, I must, that there is no such cooperation related, cooperation relating to other areas. The only the agreement is taking place to share the water, okay. um, to share the water. But it is like, cooperating to not to cooperate, in a sense. Uh, because it's always, there is a different wage, they are trying to create conflicts all the time. You have, mentioned, you have, you have had quite a number of conflicts has come up in the different, it's, it's, it's a very nice, fertile place to, for the lawyers to get engaged, because so many conflicts comes. And it goes to all kinds of tribunal, you know, um, wherever you think, there is always that. Why it happens? Because there is an agreement, for heaven's sake. There are three rivers has been given to Indian side and three rivers to Pakistan side. And even if India wants, India cannot take the water from that three rivers. Why Pakistan always complains if India builds even a run of the river barrage in the Indian side. In, and Pakistan knows that this goes within the agreement has been signed. Why it complains? We need to realize this. Are we being used in their conflict or not cooperating or cooperating in their cooperation not to cooperate? Because there is no point Pakistan, so India can take that water out. Neither India is actually seriously interested to develop anything in the Kashmir Valley, to be honest. It's a lot of politics is going on. The reason is they are playing high politics and the lawyers and the international system, international judicial system is being used for both the political gains. Because for Pakistan, Pakistan knows that it comes within the, within the agreement. What they can do, if they take it to the court, it will prolong the process. It can continue forever. This, in, this has been going on, the Ullar Barrage case. It has been going on for, you know, the Indians call it Tulbul. They can't even, for heaven's sake, agree on one name. They call it Tulbul. Indians call it Tulbul, and the, the, the Pakistanis call it Ullar. What is that problem? That problem is Indians want to put that navigation of the Jhelum River. 
They just want to keep some water to better navigation so other people can, you know, usually transportation can take place. How that will reduce the water supply to Pakistan? That won't, because the water will finally go to the Pakistan. Why Pakistan then complains? I think that we need to realize, because Pakistan complains because Pakistan doesn't have the trust on the Indian side, because if any Indian storage will be a security challenge for Pakistan because the kind of trust which is missing seriously. And it, is not come, it hasn't come from the thin air. It, in the 1965, in 1971 war, if you go that time, the Indians have used the water to fill up the canal where the Pakistani tanks haven't able to move. So that has been the security, security issues are attached to it. And I think we need to know that we are being used in these two countries misuse of their politics for their own benefits. It's not only that Pakistan can take the, is not taking this process only, but Pakistan has also its own, what do you call it, slipper cells, if I, put, if I try to use the words uh, which will not be too controversial, within Kashmir to stop it. The Ullar barrage, which was India was trying to build, but there have been some attacks on this that India cannot build. India has a real problem. It has a, it has a problem because it doesn't really get the, if they produce so much of hydropower, who is going to take that hydropower? Either Kashmir Valley will take it or the mainland take, will take it. If Kashmir Valley people are not happy that the mainland is taking that power, so why they will produce that much of power? If they produce that much of power, if give that to Kashmir Valley people, it's very difficult to get the money from them because the situation is not so easy, not so conducive to get the tax for the energy. Then India doesn't know how far that dam, that those dams are secured enough. So the, what I'm saying in all these cases, though there is a cooperation going on, there is an agreement, the agreement is not to cooperate, not to take that to the second level, because unless we move that Indus water agreement to another level where both the countries need to cooperate really, not by this partition agreement, then it won't really, it is not going to help anyway. Because they're not working together. The, very quickly, the other things which have come up is just, as I was mentioning in the beginning, China. What is happening now in Afghanistan side? There is a Kabul River. Kabul River is also a tributary of Indus. And Afghanistan has a plan to build eight to 10, 11 dams in the Kabul River. And that's the Americans are helping them and the Indians are also helping them. And that has really put a lot of stress on Pakistan because they understand this is a kind of things which is coming up in the other side, which India is trying to put into the uh, Afghanistan and encircling Pakistan. But Pakistan has its also own tricks because China has already built two dams one on the Indus, another on Satles, two small dams in the upstream. And China has built dams on the Brahmaputra. In the last year, 2016, when there was a terror attack on an Indian army camp, the Indian prime minister, he said that he will stop the water, he will withdraw from the water treaty. There was a big demand in the Indian side, we will stop the water. I don't know where they realize how they stop the water. I mean, it's, it's somehow, you know, the, the so-called strategic thinkers, they think it's a, some sort of, uh, they can do some magic when the water will go away. This doesn't really take place. I mean, then the whole country was saying that we should stop water going to Pakistan. For heaven's sake, how you will stop it? Because the water is going through this, as I mentioned, it's, not, it's impossible to bring it to the side. How on earth you will do it? So this is a question, <laughs> this is a question when China immediately started filling up the dam in the Brahmaputra when India was threatening the, um, uh, to stop the water. So China said, hey, if you guys want to play with my friend there, we have also some game in our hand in that side. So as things are getting more interesting, more exciting for a researcher and for a lawyer, but please do not confuse ourselves that we are actually leading the agenda or we are driving the agenda. The agenda is driven by the two countries' politicians and they will keep on driving till they finally get their political solution to it. Thank you.
Thank you very much. So it's one of the insights why I love international water law is that you're traveling and you're listening to stories. And thank you very much. And uh, Salman was attracting my attention to the, one of the article in the Time magazine of October 2nd. It's, the title is How China Could Weaponize Water. So it's, uh, we, yeah. So uh, now we're going to move to another part of Asia. And the floor is for Alistair. Thank you. Well, I'd like to reiterate the thanks to the organizers for the kind invitation and um, putting on a, a wonderful program. Um, I'm also conscious of uh, a rich and uh, diverse uh, number of presentations that we've had today, and I'm the last one. So I'll try and keep you entertained for a little bit longer um, uh, at, at the end of the day. Um, what I want to do is focus on um, the Mekong Basin, but really look at that interplay between what happens at a global level and how that influences, might influence what goes on at a basin level. And so to do that, I want to look at um, the Mekong River Basin and, um, and look at how uh, the two uh, universal conventions that we have, uh, the 97 Watercourses Convention and the 92 UNEC Water Convention, uh, might play a role um, within, within supporting the basin, facilitating what already happens in the basin. And I think that's quite an important point to make. It's not about replacing what happens. It's not about uh, a, a top-down overarching uh, mechanism uh, to replace what happens in the basin, but it's rather this facilitating supportive role, which I hope um, will um, be clear in my presentation. So just to give you a bit of background for, for those who don't know, um, we have these two uh, conventions uh, on the same topic, uh, international water courses, operating at the same level, operating at a global level. First, we had the 1997 Water Courses Convention, which basically uh, started with a proposal uh, in 19, uh, 1959. Uh, the UN General Assembly started to look at um, look at law of international water courses, um, uh, and that led to a decision um, to, to uh, instruct the International Law Commission to, uh, to uh, codify and progress progressively develop uh, international law in this, in this area. Um, after quite some time, from 1976 to 1994, uh, the International Law Commission developed draft articles. Um, states negotiate those articles uh, into a convention uh, that was adopted in 1997, uh, 1997 Convention on the Law of Non-Navigational Uses of International Water Courses, um, and uh, adopted in 1997, took a while uh, to enter into force. Um, I could go into why it took so long, but uh, I think uh, we don't have time for that. Um, but just to say, I think what's really significant and a, and a key milestone uh, in international watercourses law is the fact that that convention is now in force. Uh, it required 35 parties to do that. That happened in 2014, uh, with Vietnam becoming the 35th party, uh, and we have 36 parties to date. Um, and I would also say that there's a lot of interest, there's a lot of momentum now around the convention. Uh, a lot more states are, are thinking about uh, becoming party to the convention or uh, actively in the process of, of ratifying that convention. And, uh, and a lot of uh, 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 work uh, uh, by various organizations to continue to promote the, the Water Courses Convention. Um, uh, more further afield. So then we have a UNEC Water Convention. So the UNEC Water Convention, uh, uh, the UNEC, the Economic Commission for, for Europe, uh, started as a regional convention, adopted in 1992 and entered into force in 1996. Um, it has 40 country parties plus the, plus the EU. Um, and since its entry force has uh, been quite successful, I would say, 
in uh, in its development, in, in uh, looking at it, how to, to use it as a way to, to strengthen the implementation of existing uh, basin agreements and to promote the adoption of new agreements uh, or revision of agreements where, where that was needed. Um, and I think a, a key to that success has been the institutional framework related to the convention, which I'll talk about in a bit. But, most significantly, I think, for our purposes today, is a decision that was taken in 2003 by the parties to open up the convention, to say, hey, let's allow uh, non-UNECE states um, to become members of the convention. And so that decision was taken by the parties uh, in 2003. It took a while um, before that became uh, uh, entered into the amendment, entered in force, and became en operational. But now that is that is operational, and so states can now, uh, from outside the UNEC region, um, become party to the convention. So we basically have these two conventions operating, as I say, at the same level. Um, some of the parties um, uh, are party to both conventions. They see the benefit of having both conventions uh, uh, in, in force um, and operating at a global level. Some parties are only uh, party to one or the other convention, and you can see the spread um, on the map there. Similarities and differences, well, uh, Professor Tanzi has produced a, a very detailed comparative analysis of the similarities and, and differences, and if I may paraphrase, and hopefully you'll agree, um, the, the conventions are broadly si similar but different. So they might go into uh, more detail, uh, one convention might go into more detail on one aspect than the other, uh, but in that respect, they complement each other. So if there's on, only a general provision in one convention, then perhaps there's more detailed guidance. You talked about appropriate measures in Article 3 of the UNEC Water Convention earlier, which goes into quite a lot of detail on what those measures, uh, what, what, what might be seen as appropriate, and that might supplement the more general provision on uh, the duty to take all appropriate measures to prevent significant harm, which is found in the 97 Water Convention and, and Article 7. Um, so, broadly speaking, I think, and in the interest of time, we can say that, that, that they're, they're a fuller package of norms if you look at both conventions um, together. Um, but I think a very important difference with the conventions is that the 92 UNEC Water Convention has an institutional framework. So there's a meeting of the parties, um, there's a secretariat where I'm currently based, um, there's working groups, uh, task force on various aspects, uh, an implementation committee that um, Professor Tanzi chairs. Um, so I would say the UNEC Water Convention has become a living convention. Constantly, uh, the parties are, are assessing and reassessing how they might develop the convention, how they might support the implementation of the convention at the basin level. The 97 convention so far doesn't have anything similar. It doesn't have any provisions at that convention level um, uh, on the institutional framework. And then the UNEC Water Convention, through that institutional framework, also has a program of work where states and others can come together um, around various topics that support the implementation of the convention. So that's a brief overview of um, the two conventions. So let us now turn to the Mekong uh, Basin and then see how the conventions might benefit what's happening in the, in the Mekong. And uh, so... I think uh, well, the Mekong Basin has uh, a lot of challenges, I think, as we know, in terms of uh, the state's cooperation. Uh, we know China uh, being an uh, upstream state. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on uh, hydropower development within the, within the region, and you can see uh, I put up there a, a graph of some of the some of the dams that are in operation, uh, some that are under construction and some are planned. Um, it's home to 70 million um, people, uh, produces, uh, the basin produces enough rice to feed 300 
people, um, largely in the, in the downstream, um, fish central to food security within the region. MRC data in 2015 suggests that wild capture of fisheries um, on the Mekong contribute 11 billion um, to the four lower Mekong basin countries. 400 million people are uh, involved in fishery-related activities, and, and most rural populations are heavily contingent on fisheries for um, their uh, sustainable livelihoods. Um, there's also high rates of economic growth, and so a major drive to continue to develop hydropower within the, within the region. Um, hugely rich uh, basin in terms of uh, cultural uh, biodiversity. Um, uh, and so you can see that uh, increasingly there are these challenges and tensions and trade-offs between uh, different interests of, of energy, food, fisheries, rice, uh, uh, biodiversity, ecosystems, etc., etc. And this all operates, certainly for the lower Mekong Basin states, um, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, within the context of the Mekong uh, Agreement, adopted in 1995 with a, with a very um, lofty uh, ambition to cooperate in all fields of, of sustainable development, utilization, management, conservation of water, and related resources of the Mekong River Basin. So within the scope, you can say that this is a very, uh, a very holistic uh, approach within the basin. But what's interesting when you look at the design of the agreement is that when it comes to the, shall we say, the operational provisions, things get a little bit narrower. So if we look at, um, so if we look at the substantive norms, then there's, there's uh, good complementarity. We can see that the key customary international uh, law principles, substantive norms are there, equitable and reasonable use, no significant harm, even some talk of uh, protection of uh, ecosystems, ecological balance, um, which is very similar to what we'll find um, within the 92 UNEC Water Convention, the 97 UN Water Courses Convention. Perhaps Again, more detailed within some of the, uh, between the agreements, and there there's perhaps opportunities to, to, to draw from the global conventions that might have more detail around, as I say, appropriate measures or the factors for determining what is equitable and reasonable use um, to guide the implementation of the Mekong Agreement. Where it gets a little bit trickier is when it, comes to the procedural obligations and uh, around, largely around notification and consultation, which clearly uh, become extremely relevant when we talk about some of the hydropower uh, plans within the basin. And what, we've, what we see there is that the Mekong Agreement basically makes a split. It makes a split between the mainstream of a river and the tributaries of a river. And it basically says that if uh, if there are plans on the tributaries, even if that tributary is shared between two countries, if there are plans to develop uh, uh, a proposed use um, within the uh, tributaries of the Mekong Basin, then states must notify. And I say only, they must only notify um, the, the other parties within the agreement. So there's no requirement further requirement to enter into consultations. Simply, we're planning this, here's what we're planning. That's it. If uh, on the mainstream, if uh, there's a proposed use, then the obligation is essentially to uh, consult. So not only notify, but go into a consultation process um, around these projects, share information, share views and opinions on um, the benefits and um, perceived uh, uh, impacts of these projects. 
So what is this, this meant? This has meant that for a long time, uh, the uh, focus of developments on the, on the lower Mekong, the parties to the Mekong Agreement, has very much been on the tributaries. Um, and with the idea that the, the lighter touch of notification um, would, be, uh, would, would be, it would be easier for the countries to, to develop um, those, those projects. But then there are big questions in terms of cumulative impact of these projects on the tributaries. Um, uh, there, there, were, there were questions in the Yale Falls Dam, for example, in Vietnam, uh, questions whether that, that had significant impacts in Cambodia, um, but there was no uh, notification or consultation. Um, but certainly you could, you could make a strong argument that the cumulative impacts of all these tributary dams is having quite an impact on the, on, on the main, mainstream and the, and the basin. Um, what we see more recently is that um, Laos has begun to develop projects on the mainstream. Um, so has recognized more or less uh, that it has to go through the consultation process uh, established under the uh, Mekong Agreement, um, but has done that for, um, for three projects. And I think the the process that has gone through that, that, that the parties have um, utilized for, for these three projects shows, tells a lot about the limitations of the Mekong Agreement and the prior consultation process and how the benefits that the, um, the two global water conventions might bring um, uh, to the table. Uh, in each of these processes, the uh, the question of the end period of consultation was not particularly clear. Um, so uh, Laos, the, the requirement under the agreement and the, and the procedures and guidelines that support that is that it must be for a minimum of six months. So Laos got six months and said, okay, we're done. The other state said, well, it's a minimum of six months. This is a, these are big projects. We need more time to consider them. Um, can we extend the, the consultation process? And they couldn't reach agreement. And I think there's also um, some challenges in the process that is there to facilitate the states reaching agreement. Um, another, another key aspect uh, is, um, is around this issue of, of tributaries. And for one of the projects, the Don Sahong, um, it was, it was argued by Laos that this was on a tributary, so all they had to do was notify. And it was in, a, an, in an area of the Mekong River, where the river, river flows down and then it, it, it's braided. So it, it splits up and then it joins back together. So the argument was from Laos was that, well, this bit where I sh I've shown you on the map there, um, that's a tributary, so we should only um, go through a notification process. But the other states said, no, this is, uh, this is still the mainstream. And so, there's, um, so it, in the end, uh, Laos relented and it did go through the consultation process, but the ambiguity of the, of the um, convention didn't, didn't help. Um, I think if you look at, so in terms of a consultation uh, process, and you, if, you look at the, um, if you look at the UN Water Courses Convention, it's a bit clearer in terms of that process. It says six months, but that period can be extended to an additional six months if required. Um, and then if there are still concerns over the project, then uh, 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 the state should enter into consultations um, uh, and refrain from implementing the project for a further six months. So, so at least clearer steps uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of that consultation process. And I think within the UNEC Water Convention, you see a strong emphasis on the establishment of joint bodies. And the joint bodies um, have a key role to play um, uh, through, um, in terms of implementing EIAs, um, and acting as a focal point for consultations between the states. Um, and I think that's where uh, there's a big challenge within, within the Mekong Agreement, um, and particularly when it comes to dispute settlement. 
um, where the provisions of the, convention, the agreement are quite limited. Essentially, the, 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 uh, any differences should be uh, resolved by the Joint Committee or Council. Um, if that doesn't work, refer to the government, um, and uh, they should resolve in a matter. Uh, the, the matter they may be, by, by mutual agreement, or request assistance of mediation. And in all the three cases of the hydro power projects, that, that next step has not kicked in, and there's a, there's a sort of uh, an impasse now where Laos said, OK, well, we've finished the process, and the, 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 um, the, the other states are saying, well, we, 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 need, more, we need more time uh, to, to, to consider this. And, and, and I think what we find within the, the Water Courses Convention and the UNEC Water Convention is more detailed, stepwise approach to uh, disputes. So what happens after, if you can't agree through consultation after six months, what do you do then? I think there's a benefit, as you mentioned, um, uh, Attila, the, um, you have a role for a unilateral third-party fact-finding commission can be established. Um, uh, and, and I think finding the facts can go a long way to helping resolve the disputes. Um, and under the UNE Seawater Convention, you have an implementation committee um, that can play uh, a, a, a good role there. Um, so just to sum up, uh, I think what we see is that the, the two conventions can provide quite a, a, a lot to, um, to the Mekong River context and to supplement the Mekong Agreement by providing clarity on the legal status between uh, the tributaries um, and the mainstream, um, providing uh, strengthening the notification and consultation process, um, providing a more effective stepwise approach to dispute settlement. Um, uh, I think the uh, uh, stronger provisions around um, environmental impact assessment. And last but not least, within the UNEC Water Convention, I think that institutional framework can be hugely important in sharing experiences between basins, across regions, continents, um, and, and that can help uh, address some of these challenges in implementation. Um, before I sum up, Salman Salman would not forgive me if I didn't mention that uh, a more detailed research related to this uh, was published by myself and Remy Kinner from Earthrights International um, in uh, the International Water Law Journal. So if you want more information, uh, it's available there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We've heard three presentations which were interesting and which shows they show the differences between one case to another one. The common element was the issue of dam. It's quite interesting to see that everything, everywhere it has become a major issue in terms of cooperation between riparian countries. So before I give uh, the time for questions, I would like to ask Salman Salman, would you like to react in two minutes to what you've heard from? Yeah, I, I would like to react to uh, some of the points raised by Ashok Swain. Uh, Ashok mentioned, mentioned uh, two incidents uh, regarding the Indus Water Treaties, where Indus Water, Water Treaty, where India and Pakistan uh, kept really enforcing the treaty and uh, agreeing to do whatever is needed there, despite very tense situation. In the first case, the war of 1965. India was supposed to pay Pakistan 60 million dollars in installments. One installment fell during the war. Pound, sorry, pound, uh, sterling pound. Sorry, it's, it's 60 billion sterling pounds, about 150 million pounds at that time. Uh, one installment fell during the war, and the payment went through. India made the payment. It came to the uh, fund that was uh, uh, established under the World Bank uh, monitoring and administration. And the second thing is the meeting of the uh, uh, commission. Uh, that was one incident, but there was another incident where, uh, during the next 1965 war, that the meeting went ahead. And the question that we, we thought about, and I don't have an answer, I'm thinking this, I would throw it to you. Why did, why India and Pakistan have been complaining about the treaty? India is saying that they didn't get what they should, should have gotten. Pakistan is saying the treaty is tilted towards India, is giving it a lot of power uh, in the upstream uh, parts of the river. 
nevertheless, the two countries have stuck to the treaty and have implemented it, I would say, faithfully. And the question that we, I kept asking myself, why did they do that? Is it because of the presence of the World Bank? Does that mean that we really, for, for any treaty to be enforced and to be implemented and to be implemented faithfully, you need a third party? And the question, does, has the presence of the World Bank as a signatory to the treaty for certain purposes made that difference whereby India and Pakistan went ahead and fulfilled whatever obligations they had under the treaty? I think this is a question I'd like to, to hear more, more about from you rather than from us. Thank you. Aisha? Yeah, I think uh, I just... Uh, one sentence when the last year this whole I was telling you the so-called strategic experts were telling India to stop closing the, withdrawing from the treaty and stop the water I just wrote a piece saying that these are the issues you cannot do it and the second thing is you cannot stop the water that's uh, I mean then you see that there have been some people haven't really got to think about it what are the real problems and it goes into their mind and then the whole this course started changing. The, coming back to this, in the three river basins which you discussed, uh, there is one, besides the dam factor, there is a China factor. Mm. All these three basins where the China has played a role which has completely, or somehow, in some cases uh, completely, some cases in certain extent, has dismantled the balance of power in these basins. And I think the new actors have emerged. China, we have tried to keep them out of this, but China is a new and bigger player in this basin, particularly when to build the dams, because all the cooperation agreements which has been signed, Ita, you might agree or not, but most of these agreements, those who have signed in recent years in the third world, are on the basis of building new dams. If there is no new dams, there is no agreements. So we, that's because China plays a major role to build these new dams, and who is been building the new dams? Because we have before have kept building the new dams to only some people they can build, and some other countries cannot build. Whereas China has putting the money to the ones those who have now can build the dams, which were denied to build the dams. And I think these are the three in the three basins, and in most of the basins in Africa and Asia, China is playing a role of destroying the existing power balance or power symmetry, which we had tried to keep and by making it almost you know, a kind of peace prevailing uh, of some sort, but which has been, I think it's a good thing. Again, I'm sorry, putting this in. It's a good thing that this kind of maintaining the power balance of keeping the power to the hegemons and giving the water to hegemons has been challenged and the new countries, the countries, those who haven't really able to use the water, will get the chance if they use this kind of new situation well. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. I, I mean, just, just linked to that, I think what, I mean, what you see in the Mekong is you see China as an upstream hegemon in a more classical uh, position, but also playing a, a huge role in investing in hydropower development downstream um, within the lower Mekong Basin states. And I think what's been particularly challenging, I mean, we've talked about the role of EIAs earlier, and what's been particularly challenging is that all the national legislation has obligations to conduct EIAs. Um, none of that is within a transboundary context. Um, and a lot of the projects, the initial EIAs have been very limited, um, perhaps a six to eight kilometer radius of the, of the project site. And it's only later on when the uh, consultation process kicks in and you, uh, the lower state, basin states ask for additional studies um, that you get something similar to a, prop, a, a real uh, transboundary EIA, if I can say that. Um, and I, I'm not sure that's the best approach. And I, you see in Zayaburi, I mean, to the credit, Laos listened to the lower basin states to some extent. They were concerned about sedimentation flow. They were concerned about fish migration. They spent $400 million extra on redesigning the project to try to uh, accommodate some of these concerns. Um, whether they did that fully or not, um, you have to ask the states. But to me, that's a little bit late in the process. That should have been there 
more at the beginning. So I, I think that that's where, and perhaps you know, under a regional framework where you have a regional framework for conducting transboundary environmental impact assessment, like the, the ESPU convention, um, that would happen earlier. Um, perhaps if you have um, funding from development banks and through safeguard policies, that might happen earlier. Um, but I think if it's private investment, then, then it, and there's, there's not that uh, uh, framework, legal framework for conducting joint EIAs at an international level, then relying on the national legislation might not always help. Thank you. So I hope you're not exhausted. <laughs> we still have a bit of time for questions and comments. Yeah, Bolgia. I'm um, and my question is related to the Mekong Delta. Uh, and the rules on tributaries, you said there is only notification obligation day. And what is the affected downstream state would say, but consultation is customary law obligation, irrespective of the Mekong Delta agreement. Uh, would the other party planning something on the tributary argue, but this is Lex, lex Specialis? and therefore I don't care about general customer international law? Or would the general customer law argument prevail? What's your view on that? <laughs> That's for my coin. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> rightly or wrongly, I think that the parties to the Mekong Agreement have relied very strongly on the Mekong Agreement. Um, I would say, uh, generally, uh, the knowledge and awareness of uh, Kasmi international law um, within, the, within the region um, might be, uh, uh, certainly within the earlier projects, it's developing, but having, that, having a community of lawyers from each of the basin states that have a shared understanding of the rules and principles of customary international law, how they might complement the Mekong Agreement, I think that's still very much work in progress. So I think that's why there's been this tendency to look at specifically at the Mekong Agreement. Um, and let's be honest, it, it serves it served the, the country's interests. Uh, that for Thailand, uh, Laos, Vietnam, and Cambodia all have interests in developing projects on the, 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 the tributaries. So, so I think that's probably um, led to a, a, a kind of more broader interpretation. If you, were, if you were extremely strict in the interpretation of the Mekong Agreement, you might even say that it, it does cover um, uh, some level of uh, um, uh, notification, at least indirectly notification and consultation, even on the tributaries, because of the substantive norms, because of this requirement that it must be equitable and reasonable use, you must take appropriate measures to prevent significant harm, protect the ecosystem balance. So there, how can you not, how can you, how can you do that uh, uh, if you don't um, enter into some sort of communication? But, but yeah, uh, I hope that sort of explains a little bit of the uh, sort of the environment in which this, this is, uh, yeah, these discussions go on. So before we conclude, I'm going to ask a question to Ashok and, and then to Salman. You've spoken about this instrumentalization of this agreement by, in fact, and the river by the two countries, Pakistan and India, playing a game, which is a political game. But then you didn't really speak about the content of the agreement, and the agreement was concluded in 1960, so it's quite an oldish agreement. And the question that I have is that, what should be done to sort of modernize this treaty so that it protects correctly the Indus River and the watershed around the Indus River? I have. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I think it's an excellent question because the I might be sounding like the 1960 agreement was a useless agreement. It's not. At that point of time, it was an agreement which was needed, which I think at this point of time, it has fulfilled its duties of keeping that agreement. But if you the considering the new need and the situation, uh, unless the political leadership of India and Pakistan see the 
interest of people and the considering the water situation, the water demand, if they have a change of heart and change of mind with it, then possible. But the question goes, who is doing what? Because this is, you probably know, the World Bank also started some kind of, it's not World Bank which started Abu Dhabi Dialogue. You might have some people have heard the Abu Dhabi Dialogue which started in 2006. It was first started by International Institute of Strategic Studies, brought together of the, all the basin countries in the Himalayan basins to Abu Dhabi. And I was asked to write the first concept paper where I argued that it should, the, well, as I said, the first sentence that the Inter Indus Water Treaty has fulfilled its duties or its requirements. Now we need to move on to the, but who will bail the cat? Because in that, that was my opinion. I, I, of course, I have an Indian name, but I have, you know, that, that creates problem for Pakistanis. They thought that it's an Indian um, view, and the Indians looked at me where this guy got this view. Uh, so it was a kind of situation, who is actually bringing this view? Then I was taken out of the, when the World Bank took the Abu Dhabi dialogue since that, because I was a kind of, you know, not a person who will be getting into there, and I think I understand that. But the question comes, who is going to get these politicians to see what exactly this basin needs? Pakistan is suffering from the huge, huge flood every year, and the water scarcity is a massive. And the internal conflict over the water in Pakistan is, all, is almost like a breaking point. Similarly, in the Indian side, the Punjab, the dust the, which was used to be the wheat uh, bowl of India, most of the Punjabi farmers have migrated to Canada to do the farming. The Punjab is absolutely not doing anything right now. And the water is being diverted to other states and it's also creating major conflicts there. So a situation which needs to, this political leadership needs to come out of that mindset. And here, I think as a water researchers, we have an obligation to put this into their mind that this is what for their own long-term and short-term interest is important to sit together and work for a second, what I call it, industry treaty two. Uh, so they need to move to the second tree. Thank you. Thank you, and to, yeah, you'll have time to react to that, but I'd like to, to ask you a question because uh, you've presented the Nile situation and you've presented uh, this, the building of the Dam Renaissance as a way to, in fact, sort of unify the three countries, Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan. And listening to you, I had this feeling that, you know, everything was going so well in this new world that these two countries would be able to collaborate and cooperate and so on. And I'd like to have a sort of another side of the story. Is Egypt, Egypt really ready to cooperate? And uh, is Sudan ready to cooperate? And what do we need more than what we have done so far? I have said it before and I've written a number of times. I think it is really sad that cooperation has been absent in the Nile Basin for the last 60, 70 years. Because I look at the Renaissance Dam, and I say to myself, why wasn't this dam built in 1960 in lieu of the Swan High Dam, Rosaris Dam, Hashmal Girba Dam that Sudan built? It, the three countries would have, gen, would have reaped the same benefits by building, this, uh, by building the Renaissance Dam, or it was called at that time the Border Dam, in Ethiopia, rather than building the high dam in, in Egypt and northern Sudan and building the other small dams in, in South Sudan. There were catastrophic environmental uh, problems, social problems. More than 120,000 people have to be vol uh, involuntarily resettled. 70,000 uh, Nubian, Egyptian Nubians and 50,000 uh, Sudanese Nubians. Large tract of land, about half, half a million hectares, was submerged under the lake. And then you have the, the uh, evaporation. 10 billion cubic meters evaporate annually from this huge lake because of the climate in that area and because of the soil. So there are huge environmental um, costs. And the, 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 instead of that, they could have built the border dam and saved all of this and reap the same benefits, power, irrigation, water, but there was, no, was, there, was no, there was no cooperation. The same thing happened now. When Ethiopia started this dam, they offered to Sudan and Egypt to have it as jointly owned, financed, and operated. And Egypt and Sudan ignored that offer. And Ethiopia went ahead. 
The reason they ignored that offer is because there was a bet that Ethiopia would not be able to raise $5 billion to build the dam. The dam will stop at any minute. And Sudan and Egypt lost that bet because Ethiopia managed to raise the funds from its own resources. So I, I, if I have painted the rosy picture, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I wasn't right. It is not. I mean, they signed an agreement. They signed two agreements. And the two agreements, Sudan and Egypt, basically conceded to the fact that Ethiopia has rights over the water, they can build a dam, and they would have to do those studies. But then they signed the agreement at 5 o'clock, and 5 or 5, there will be a statement from one high Egyptian official saying, the dam is going to really harm Egypt, a large tract of lands will become desert, the Swan High Dam will not be able to generate electricity. So there are two voices that were coming. The political voice, uh, which is, I think is basically addressing the Egyptian people, and the negotiating voice. So there is this confusion. Will, will Egypt ever concede to the fact that this is really a river owned by 11 countries, or it's an Egyptian and part of the Sudanese river? I, I think it's going to be very difficult for them to, to, to reach that, that, uh, that, that, to reach that uh, point. But the fact is, the dam is now a reality. The, uh, as I mentioned in my presentation, the playing field has been leveled. Uganda is building a couple of dams, by the way. They, they're building Isimba, they're building uh, uh, Karoma, they're building couple, without even talking to Sudan and Egypt. So there is the, the, the countries have decided, the, the upper stream countries have decided to go ahead. And unless Sudan and Egypt uh, wake up and agree that this is really a river that's owned by all of them, we need cooperation, we need to look beyond sharing the water to sharing benefits, the situation will continue like this, ups, ups and downs between cooperation and statements of war and disputes and conflict. Thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to thank the three panelists and I think that uh, I'm going now get to give the floor to Ellen. Yes, but before maybe we applaud the panelists and the chair for this very nice panel.